In this video, I'll be going over how to make this simple Space Invaders inspired game where you shoot at goblins to stop them from reaching your end of the screen. My hope for this video is to just give you an idea of one way you could put together a project using the SDK. But with limited time, I can only go over a very basic game architecture. If you're a beginner, I would recommend watching my other SDK tutorials on Lua, sprites, collisions, and object-oriented programming to better understand the concepts I touch on in this video. Let's get started. First, start off by making an images folder where we're going to store our images, as well as a main.lua file. In the images folder, I just have two images, a 32 by 32 pixel sprite of the player, as well as a 32 by 32 pixel sprite of a goblin. In the main file, I'll start off by importing these four libraries. We're going to be using them eventually. Then I'll declare two variables. First one is PD, just so we don't have to write out playdate every time and we can make the code look a little cleaner. This const is us declaring that this will never change, which has a slight performance benefit. The second one is GFX, which is similar to the first one but for the graphics library, since we'll be using that a lot and it gets pretty messy if you have to type out the whole thing every time. I'll also create our update function here. In it, I'll put the sprite update function. If you haven't watched my video on sprites, as a refresher, a sprite is a graphics object that handles a lot of useful things for us in regards to drawing something to the screen. Sprites are managed by something called a draw list, where you can add and remove sprites from. And this function tells all the sprites in the draw list to update. If you recall, the update function is called every frame, so about 30 times a second. And since we're putting this in the update function, we're telling all the sprites to update every frame. We can do the same thing for timers with this update timers function, which tells all the active timers in the game to update. If you're a bit confused, that's okay. I'll revisit this concept once we have some more context. Let's start off by first creating the player. I'm going to create a new file called player.lua. I want those same shorthands for the playdate and graphics variables, so I'll add them here too. We'll be creating a player class. If you haven't watched my video on object-oriented programming for the playdate, this might be a bit confusing, so I recommend checking out that video first. We'll be extending the sprite class, which, as a reminder, gives this player class all the same properties as a sprite. I'll create an init method with two parameters, x and y, which will be the starting coordinates for the player. If you recall, the init method is the function that gets called whenever you create a new instance of an object. I'll then create a local variable, player image, and call gfx.image.new, and pass in the path to our image. This creates a new image using the Playdate graphics library. I'll call self, colon, set image, and set the player image to the image we just created. If you recall, self is referencing the current instance of this object, and set image is a sprite method that sets the sprite's image. I'll then move the player to the x and y coordinates passed in. And lastly, use add to add the player to the draw list. Again, this makes it so that sprite update function we're calling in the main file knows to update the sprite. Let's go back to the main file. I'll import the player file we just created. Then I'll create an instance of the player class by calling the player constructor, then passing in where we want the player to spawn. I'll just put x is 30 to place the player a little bit away from the left side of the screen, and 120 to put the player vertically in the middle. If you build and run it, you should see your player sprite. Next, let's make the player move. Back in the player file, I'll extend the sprite update function with player colon update. The sprite update function in the main file will be calling this update function every frame when the sprite is added with the add method. We can take in some player input by writing an if statement and calling pd.button is pressed. This is a function that returns true whenever the specified button is pressed. We can specify that button by passing in pd.kbutton up. In here, I'll use the sprite move by method to move the player by 0, negative 1. The first argument is how much we want to move the player on the x axis, which is 0. And the second argument is how much we want to move the player on the y axis, which I put negative 1 for, since we're moving up. For the playdate, the coordinate system origin is at the top left and increases down and to the right. We'll call an else if statement and check for the down button and call move by in the downwards direction. If we run it, you'll see that if you press up or down, you can move the player. The player is moving kind of slow, so let's change that. Here, we're moving the player by only one unit every frame, but if we change it to something higher, like three, we'll be moving much faster. Since these are the same number, I'll go ahead and create a property called speed and set it in the init method. Then we'll replace the ones with self.speed. However, we run into another issue. The player can move indefinitely outside of the bounds of the screen. Let's implement a very basic fix. You can check the y position of the player using self.y. So let's write an if condition when we're moving up. We'll only move the player up if their y position is greater than zero. When we're moving down, let's only move the player down if the y position is less than 240, which is the height of the screen. If we run this, we'll see that the player can't move past the top and bottom of the screen. 
You'll notice that half the player is cut off though, which is because the X and Y position corresponds to the center of the sprite. I think it's fine to leave it as is, but if you don't want that, you can consider either adding an offset to the if conditions or using the playdate collision system. Next, let's create a projectile for the player to shoot. I'll create a new file called bullet.lua and create a bullet class that extends the sprite class. In the init function, we'll take in an X and Y position to spawn the bullet at, as well as the speed we want the bullet to travel at. We'll be drawing the bullet using code, since it's just a simple circle. I'll create a local variable bullet size with the radius of the bullet, which I'll set to 4. Then, we can create a new image with gfx.image.new. Instead of a path to an image, we can instead pass in two arguments, which are the width and height of the image. I'll set it to the diameter of the bullet, which will just be double the radius. We can draw to the image using push context. I go over exactly how push context works in my video on sprites, but essentially, push context allows us to draw directly onto an image instead of the screen. We'll use the Playdate graphics library to draw a circle using the draw circle at point function. The first two arguments are the x and y position, which we can just set as the radius. And the last argument is the radius itself. Lastly, we can pop the context. Bullet image now contains an image with a circle of radius 4. We can set the sprite image to this image we just created. Next, I'll just set the speed to a speed property on the object, move the bullet to the x and y position, and add it to the draw list. To make the bullet move, we'll again use the update function. This time, instead of move by, we'll actually use the move with collisions method since eventually we want to add collisions to the bullet to allow it to hit our enemies. Move with collisions takes in two arguments, the x and y positions to move the sprite to. Since this is an absolute position and not a relative position, we'll pass in the position of the bullet at first with self.x and self.y. Then, we can add self.speed to the x position to move the bullet to the right by whatever speed is every frame. You need to add a collision rec to the sprite in order to use move with collisions. We can do that by writing this. I'll explain what this is doing later in the video, but let's move on for now. We can go to the player script and import the bullet file at the top. Then, in the update method, I'll create a new if statement to check if the A button has been pressed. If so, we can spawn a bullet by calling the bullet constructor and passing in our three arguments. I'll just use the player position as the spawn position, and 5 as the bullet speed. If we build and run the game, you'll see when I press A, the player shoots out a bullet. Next, let's create our enemy. Again, we'll create a new enemy class that extends the sprite, an init function with x and y parameters, as well as a move speed parameters to dictate how fast the enemy will move. We can pretty much do the same thing as a player init function, where we create an image with a path to our enemy image. Mine is just called goblin. Then, setting the sprite image to that image, moving the sprite, and adding it to the draw list. Lastly, I'll store the move speed into a move speed property. To make the enemy move, we'll create an update function and use the move by method to move the enemy left. I'll set the x amount to the negative of self.move speed and the y as zero. Let's test this out by importing the enemy script in the main file and calling the enemy constructor. I'll spawn the enemy at 400, 120 with a move speed of 1. If you build and run, you should see the enemy moving. Currently, if you shoot at the enemy, nothing happens, so let's change that. I'll first add a collision box to the enemy. We can do that by using the setCollideRect method. I'll call it in the enemy init function. The first two arguments are where we want the collision rectangle to start, so we'll set that to 0, 0 to denote the top left of the sprite. Then, the next two arguments will be the size of the collision box. We can use the handy get size method that returns the width and height of the sprite for that. Lastly, we don't want the enemies getting stuck on each other, so we'll create a collision response function and return overlap. I go more into specifics about that in my video about collisions. In the bullet script, we'll handle the collision event. Move with collisions actually returns four things. Actual x and actual y, which are the actual x and y position that the sprite ends up after taking collisions into consideration. Collisions, an array of things that the sprite has collided with, and length, the length of that collision array. We'll capture them into local variables like so. We can check if a collision even occurred by just checking if the length of the collision array is greater than zero. If so, we'll loop through the collisions array. Since at any point, the bullet could technically be colliding with multiple enemies at once, and the only things we collide with are enemies, the collisions array pretty much just contains a list of all the enemies the bullet is touching at any given moment. I'll write for index collision in pairs and pass in the collisions array, then close off the for loop. Collision now contains information about a single collision event with an enemy. This collision is actually a table with multiple fields, which you can find more information about in the SDK documentation. The field we're concerned with is other, which contains the sprite that we're colliding with. So I'll access that using square brackets and store it in a local variable called collided object. We can do a check to see if collided object really is an enemy by using the isA function. 
and passing in the enemy class. We don't really need to do this since there's not really anything that's not an enemy, but you would probably need to check in a more complex game. If the check returns true, we'll remove the enemy from the draw list by using the remove method. Then, after the for loop, we can remove the bullet itself using the remove method on itself. Let's try this in game. If you go to view sprite collisions, you should be able to see the collision boxes. And if I shoot the bullet at the enemy, it disappears. One small thing to fix is that the bullet actually flies off the screen forever, and you'll eventually have tons of bullets off screen that could cause performance issues or crash your game. We can fix this by writing an else if statement in the collision code and checking if actual x is greater than 400, which is the width of the screen, and removing the sprite if it is. Let's add a spawning system into the game to spawn in the enemies. I'll create a new file called enemyspawner.lua. We'll import the enemy file and define our playdate constants, as well as create a spawn timer local variable. I'll add a start spawner function that will call at the start of the game. We're going to be using random values, so I'll seed the random function with math.randomseed and pass in the current time. The math library comes by default with Lua and contains many useful math related functions. Random seed mixes up the randomness to make the game different every time. Let's call a create timer function that we'll make next. In our create timer function, let's generate a random number of milliseconds to wait before we spawn the next enemy using the math.random function. I'll just put between 500 and 1000 for now to wait between a half second and one second. We can then use a playdate timer method, perform after delay, to do something after a certain amount of time. The first argument is how long we should wait, which I'll set as spawn time. The second argument is something special called a callback function, which is basically a function that can be called at a later time, which in this case is done after the delay. I'll create this function like so, and call create timer again to keep the timer running, and a spawn enemy function that we'll create next. Let's set the timer to the spawn timer variable as well. In the spawn enemy function, I'll first get a random spawn position by using math.random again. This time, I'll just set it between 10 and 230 to be a little away from the top of the screen and a little away from the bottom of the screen as well. We'll call the enemy constructor and set the x position at 430 to be slightly off the screen, the y position at the random position, and set the movement speed to just be one. Lastly, I'll create a stop spawner function that checks for the existence of the spawn timer and removes it. Let's try this out. I'll go back to the main function, delete our references to the enemy, and import enemy spawner instead. We'll just call start spawner after creating our player. If we build and run the game, we should start to see the enemy spawning and be able to shoot them. However, there's no scoring system yet, so let's add that in. I'll create a new file called score display.lua. After adding in our constants, I'll create two local variables, score sprite and score. For the display, I'll use this as an example of working with sprites without extending it into a subclass. Let's create a function called create score display. In it, we'll create a new sprite and set it to the score sprite and set the score to zero. I'll also call an update display function that we'll create later. Let's move it to the top right of the screen by setting the center to the top left of the sprite with set center, moving it and adding it to the draw list. Next, I'll create the update display function for creating our display image. I'll create the score text by concatenating the string score with the score itself. Next, we can get the width and height of the text by using get text size, which we'll use to set the dimensions of our text image. Here, we can go ahead and create the score image. Next, we'll use push context on that score image and draw our text using the draw text function. The first argument is just the string that we want to draw, and the next two arguments are the position, which we'll set to 0, 0. Lastly, let's set the image on the score sprite. Next, we'll create two helper functions. First will be increment score. We'll add one to the score and call the update display function. Next will be reset score. We'll reset the score back to zero and update the display. If we go to the main file, let's import score display and call the create score display function at the beginning. Next, let's go to the bullet script and call increment score whenever we remove an enemy. If we build and run this, we should see our score display and see it increment whenever we hit an enemy. So currently, there's no losing condition, so let's add that really quickly. In the enemy spawner script, let's create a function called clear enemies. We'll use the get all sprites function to get a list of all the sprites in the draw list. Next, we'll loop through all the sprites and check if the sprite is an enemy. If it is, we can remove it from the draw list. In the main file, I'll create a reset game function that calls reset score, clear enemies, stop spawner, and start spawner. Next, I'll go in the enemy script. In the update function, we can check if the enemy has passed the left edge of the screen by checking if the x position is less than zero. If so, we'll call reset game. 
If we run the game, we should see the score reset and the enemies clear if an enemy makes it past you. Currently, there's no bullet impact. So, as our final task, let's add a bit of screen shake. I'll create a new screenshake.lua file and create a screen shake class that extends the sprite class. For the init function, we'll set a shake amount property to zero and add the sprite to the draw list. Let's also create a set shake amount method that takes an amount and set shake amount to that value. In the update function, let's check if the shake amount is greater than zero. If so, we'll create a random angle. We can do this by calling math.random multiplied by pi multiplied by two. We'll then get a random x offset, shake x by calling math.floor on the cosine of the shake angle multiplied by the shake amount. The floor function just rounds the value down to the nearest integer. We'll do the same thing for the y offset by use sine instead. Don't worry too much about what the math is doing. It just generates a small horizontal and vertical offset. We can then decrement shake amount by one and use a special function called set offset to offset our display by shake x and shake y. If shake amount is not greater than zero, then we can reset the display offset back to zero. In our main file, we can import screen shake. We'll create a local variable called screen shake sprite and set that equal to the screen shake constructor. This stores the screen shake object into this variable. We can then create a global function called set shake amount that we can use to set the shake amount in the screen shake sprite. The first place we can use this is by shaking the screen when the game is reset, and we can call set shake amount with a value of 10. Next, in the bullet script, when we hit an enemy, we can call set shake amount with a value of 5. Now, in game, you can see that when we hit our lose condition, there's a big shake as the game gets reset. We also have a smaller shake when we hit an enemy. Things you could do to extend this code is by changing the spawn time or the enemy movement speed as the score increases, adding a cooldown to the player shooting, adding a win or lose screen, different enemy types, and sound effects. My hope for this video was to give you a general idea of how you can use sprites in different aspects of the SDK together. Like and subscribe if you thought this was helpful in some way and you would like to see more Playdate related content. Thanks to all my Patreon supporters for making videos like this possible, and see you next time.